بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وفض الصلوات وتم تسليمات على سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد so الحمد لله we are looking at some of the corresponding verses to each night of Ramadan so the corresponding 30 ajza 30 parts so uh, this session we are looking at the sixth juz so that means we're one-fifth of the way into uh, Ramadan alhamdulillah and we are going to look at the verses beginning with Surah Al-Ma'idah and Surah Al-Ma'idah is the fifth uh, chapter in the Quran so the fifth chapter or fifth surah and we will look at the beginning verses of Surah Al-Ma'idah that are in the sixth Jews of the Quran that begins with Qawlihi Ta'ala A'udhu Allahi Min Shaitan Rajeem Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Ya Ayyuh Al-Ladheena Amanu Awfu Bil-Uqood Uhillat Lakum Bahimatu Al-An'ami Illa Ma Yutla Alaykum Ghayra Muhillna Al-Sayli Wa Antum Hurum Inna Allaha Yahkumu Ma Yurid so, so far we have been reading uh, or looking at the verses from the chapters that are considered uh, the long chapters in the Qur'an. And uh, all of them, mostly all of them except for Al-An'am, parts of it anyway, uh, have been revealed in the Medinian period, in the time that the Prophet sent him after the Hijrah when they went to Al-Medina. <clears throat> and so you will find many of the... Um, Asbab uh, al-Nuzul, many of the uh, contexts of the revelation, uh, the particular situation on the ground, as it were, during the time the verses were revealed, um, are applicable and uh, commensurate with being in, in Medina. So these verses, uh, these set of verses, as we'll see, deal with uh, al-Uhud or al-Uqud, so al-Aqd, means literally a knot what an act here means something that you by uh, intend to abide by so uh is the wedge for example marriage contract so it could mean contract uh could be a seller or buying and selling contract so these are things that you intend to carry out that you intend to abide by uh, that you have stated an intention and you have a resolve to go by it so in the very beginning of this chapter, uh, Allah SWT instructs the believers, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, awfu bil uqud. O you believe, fulfill your obligations. Ibn Ajiba says there's six types of obligations uh, that one must fulfill as a believer. And he says uh, they are uh, financial obligations. So hifz uh, al so a financial obligation, if you uh, get into, a, take a loan and you have a debt, then to intend to pay it back. And also the obligation between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to pay the zakat, uh, sadaqat, things like this. Hifz uh, al-ansab, so the nasab, which is uh, proper lineage. And so we see some of the verses that come uh, a few verses later uh, in this uh, surah talking about uh, who are applicable and who are marriageable. So when Allah SWT talks about وَالْمُحْسَنَتْ وَالْمُؤْمِنُ وَالْمُحْسَنَتْ وَالْمُحْسَنَتْ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ إِذَا أَتَيْتُمُهُنَّ جُورَهُنَّ مُحْسِنِينَ غَيْرَ مُسْعَفِحِينَ So the muhsanat are the, uh, those that are, are considered to be virtuous from amongst the believers and from amongst Ahl al-Kitab, uh, according to some interpretations, are those who are marriageable. So that's part of hifz al-ansab, preservation of lineage and abiding by our promises or obligations there. Hivzul Adyan, right? So Hivzul Adyan means the preservation of our religion. And so obligations that are part of our religion, obviously, are part of those six. That's the third one he mentions. The fourth, Hivzul Abdan, uh, which is to the preservation of, uh, of the Abdan, of uh, the bodies and that which we consume and things like this. So we see 
here. Um, the next verse is, What has been made permissible from you from that is which to eat? That's also an obligation. Hivvullisan, uh, and the obligations of the tongue. So to avoid uh, prohibitions of the tongue, al niva and the nima, backbiting and slander and calumny and all those sorts of things, which some of the verses in Al-Ma'idah later on, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, and hivvul ayman, and ayman are your oaths and another or or yameen. So if you uh, make an oath to do something, then um, having the intention and resolve to carry it out also is part of uh, carrying out those uh, contractual obligations, as is mentioned here in the ver first, ver first verse. So, you believe, fulfill your obligations. Then the next part of the first verse. So he says, for your obligations, livestock animals are lawful as food for you, with the exception of what is about to be announced to you. So verses that are coming later. Uh, you are forbidden to kill game while you are on pilgrimage. So that's one of the uh, prohibitions if you are in a state of ihram. So that means the state of ihram, you're doing umrah or hajj, then there are certain things you're not allowed to do. Amongst them is to engage in uh, game hunting. So you can't go hunting for game uh, or actually kill anything while you're in that state of ihram. Uh, and then he says, uh, in a state of pilgrimage. In Allah, God commands what he wills. So even though the translation here it says uh, it has been made permissible for you the food of Bahimatul An'am, the Arabic actually doesn't say that explicitly. It just says It has been made permissible for you the Bahima, and Bahima is animal that is to be eaten, right? A Bahima or a beast. Well an'am, yani from an naam, you know, those that are considered to be lawful for you. And other verses in the Quran, most notably in Surah An'am, which comes after this surah, it talks about Thamaniyata uh, Azwaj. Thamaniyata Azwaj. So eight pairs. So male and female uh, are four categories. So that uh, includes uh, sheep, goats, uh, cows, and camels in general. And then any any kind of animal related to that. So related to the cow would be the uh, water buffalo, and perhaps you can throw in there bison as well. And related to the camel, perhaps you can say the llama, you know, kind of, you know, a dromedary animal like that. And to uh, the sheep, all variations of sheep, which includes rams and, and, and yaks perhaps, uh, and then goats also, which, you know, different types of goats. So all of those are considered from uh, behemoth and an'am uh, and are considered halal. Of course, there are other things that are halal besides that. And when we get to the verse that talks about the muharramat, about which is forbidden, then we'll see that. So, lakum an'am. So it doesn't say explicitly as food, but this is inferred from the verse. Later on, when it talks about, when we talk about hibz al ansab, that which is in terms of marriageable uh, uh, members or marriageable people. It will say, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ وَبَنَاتُكُمْ وَخَالَاتُكُمْ Surah An-Nisa, the, the, the chapter that came before this. حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ وَبَنَاتُكُمْ وَأَخَوَاتُكُمْ وَعَمَّاتُكُمْ وَخَالَاتُكُمْ إِلَى آخِرِ الْآيَةِ And it has been forbidden for you, your mothers and your sisters, uh, and your mothers and your daughters and your sisters and your, your paternal aunts and your maternal aunts. There didn't say specifically for marriage, but again, it can be inferred because no one in the right mind would say, oh, maybe it means it's halal to marry the behima and then it's haram to eat your mama, your sister, or your kalam So um, that's why the Mufassirun, they say that the study of the language is uh, essential uh, in understanding the words of the Quran because 
you have to understand how their Arabic language is, and especially the language of the Qur'an, sometimes that which is uh, inferred, or let's say, uh, as the scholars of grammar say, uh, or the scholars of Balagha, of Arabic rhetoric, is omitted, or maskut anhu, or mahdhuf, sometimes they say, hudifa kada al-amil, or hudifa al-maful bihi, wa yufham min as you know, they say stuff like that. The direct object here is not mentioned, but it can be understood from the context of, of the of the language, and so I mentioned this because sometimes people say, "Well, that's not mentioned in the Quran that it's haram specifically." Yani, for example, um, uh, the Quran says, "La taqrabu zina." La taqrabu zina. Do not approach fornication. It doesn't say la tazinu. So someone who's trying to be clever and say, "Well, it doesn't say specifically," it just says la taqrabu. So you know, it might mean something else. But you have to understand how the Arabic language is, and that those things that can be inferred um, are just as authoritative based upon the understanding and rules of the various sciences of Arabic language, which include our grammar, which is nahu, and sarf, which is morphology, and balagha, which is um, uh, rhetoric and, and, and uh, rhetorical devices and so forth. So all of those things you find within, within the Qur'an. So, أُحِلَّتْ لَكُمْ بَهِيمَةُ الْأَنْعَامِ إِلَّا مَا يُتْلَى عَلَيْكُمْ Except that which is coming later, غَيْرَ مَحْرُنَ الصَّيْدِ وَأَنْتُمْ حُرُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَحْكُمُ مَا يُرِيدُ So, the idea here then is الْوَفَاءِ بِالْعُقُودِ To fulfill one's obligations. And so, in terms of the إِشَارَةِ uh, ibn Ajiba, he says that um, any obligations that you take upon yourself, even if they're internal ones, right? If you have an obligation upon yourself to uh, to remove the aghyar, right? To to remove everything that distracts you from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, uh, and then alayka bil wafa, then you should stick to that. You should stick to that commitment and abide by it uh, as much as you can. So here we have a general principle in the deen to fulfill one's commitments and one's obligations. So that also means in anything in life. Uh, if you if you work uh, a job and you have a certain contractual commitment that you work X hours in the day or you'll deliver you know, X number of deliverables if you have a contract, then it's part of your deen, not just a contractual obligation like in the secular world you might think or in the dunya, but it's part of your deen to deliver on those particular contractual obligations. And they, the ulama also said, if you are a citizen of a state that has certain rules, uh, traffic laws and uh, and tax laws and things like that, um, whether we agree with them or not, then we have a certain obligation to abide by them uh, in as much as it is expected uh, as a citizen to do that. Of course, if there are things that are unjust and clearly unjust, and there are ways why, by which we can express our displeasure with uh, such an unjust uh, law or a just system then and and the rules of of being a uh, citizen of that particular state allow for such or culturally acceptable for for such kind of engagement in that way then we do we can do that uh, the best that we can with it um but generally the idea is ofu will you know uh, fulfill your obligations then Allah SWT says يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تحلوا شعائر الله ولا الشهر الحرام ولا الهدي ولا القلائد ولا آمين البيت الحرام يبتغون فضلا من ربهم ورضوانا وإذا حللتم فاصطادوا ولا يجري منكم شنائر قوم أن صدوكم عن المشرد الحرام أن تعتدوا وتعاونوا على البذ والتقوى ولا تعاونوا على الإثم والعدوان واتقوا الله إن الله شديد العقاب so you believe, do not violate the sanctity of God's rights, the sacred month, the sacrificial animals, including the garlanded, nor those going to the sacred house to seek the bounty and pleasure of their Lord. But when you have completed the rites of pilgrimage, you may hunt. Do not let your hatred for the people who barred you from the sacred mosque induce you to break the law. Help one another to do what is right and good. Do not help one another towards sin and hostility. Be mindful of God, for his punishment is severe. So as we said, there's some asbab nuzul, there's some context, especially this particular verse, when it was revealed to uh, the Prophet ﷺ and then uh, from the Prophet ﷺ to the Sahaba, in that 
uh, after the conquest of Mecca, after Fath Mecca, uh, the Prophet and the companions now had control over the sacred house. But yet, there were still uh, Kaaba, yani al Haram. Yet there were still people from around the peninsula, some of them who had not accepted Islam yet, who still sought to make pilgrimage, and uh, maybe even some of the members of Quraysh. So some of the companions had sought to prevent them from doing that, because they remembered in the year of the Sulh of al Hudaybiyah, which happened a few years before that, two and a half years before that, they remembered how they were prevented from making the Umrah, the lesser pilgrimage, and they were forced to come back the year after, even though they had prepared to come do the, uh, the pilgrimage that year. So here the Quran is admonishing them and saying that if they are seeking Fadl mir Rabbihim Ridwana, and here the Fadl could be even just Tijara, could be trade. Remember, uh, the Hajj pilgrimage uh, was a the, the premier, as you can call it, convention trading event uh, of the year in the Arabian Peninsula. So tribes from all over the peninsula would come and they would bring their wares and they would sell them and there was even sort of a festival like atmosphere and this is where we got uh, the, the popular uh, famous souk called souk or uh, the souk or the, the market of Al-Qadh which uh, uh, people also uh, vied with one another in, in poetry and the famous seven odes, the hanging odes or seven muallaqat uh, these were. This is where they were first recited, and it was considered to be the most eloquent of the pre-Islamic uh, Arabian poetry, and, and so forth. So, uh, all of that culture was still kind of in place, um, even when, uh, even after the conquest of Mecca. So, here uh, they're instructed that because the Hajj also falls in the Shahr al Haram. So, uh, in the sacred month, and the sacred months were things that were observed even before Islam, from the time of uh, perhaps Ibrahim alayhi salam. So, do not spill blood in the sacred months. Of course, verses that come later, we will see there's some exceptions. If they fight you, then, um, you know, to defend yourself is more important than observing the rights of the sacred month. But generally speaking, they're not to fight in the sacred months. لا تحلو شعائر الله So, the شعائر comes from the singular of sha'ira, which means something that is a right of an act of worship. So the rights of hajj, for example. لا تحلو شعائر الله ولا الشهر الحرام Nor the sacred month. ولا الهدي The hedi is a sacrificial animal. And they had hedi. So even now when we do hajj, we have sacrificial animals. Today we kind of go and buy a ticket and the authorities in Mecca or Mina take care of it for us. But back then you actually brought your animal, which was called Sulq al hadi So you would drive your own sacrificial animal with you on the way to pilgrimage. So they were not to be uh, violated either. That's why la tuhillu, in other words, do not violate. Wala al hadiya wala al qalaid. So the qalaid also is a type of sacrificial animal, more specific though, that which has been uh, marked. Here he, he, the, the translator uh, calls it garlanded, which, which means marked. So sometimes they would mark with like a, a type of mark, or sometimes occasionally cut the animal, or they would mark it with a, you know, a ring around its neck, whatever it might be, the animal would be marked um, for the, uh, that it was a sacrificial animal. So, this word means to intend. The plural of the, the one who is intending to go to al Bayt al Haram, to go to the sacred house. All they are seeking is fadl from their Lord, uh, bounty and pleasure of their Lord. So fadl, the bounty and pleasure of the Lord. So what we call that sentence there is what we call it in Arabic, jumla a'taradiyya. So it was something that is coming as a... Uh, a sentence in between two sentences that are related. So the next part, وَإِذَا حَلَلْتُمْ فَاسْطَادُوا That's referring back to the first verse, right? Because when we talked about غَيْرُ مُحِلُّ الصَّيْدِ وَنْتُمْ حُرُمْ So you're not to hunt animals if you are uh, uh, in the state of ihram. But إِذَا حَلَلْتُمْ فَاسْطَادُوا So التحلل من الإحرام So now you got out of your ihram. This is the khitab addressed to the Muslims. فَاسْطَادُوا Then you can hunt. 
ولا يجرمنكم شنآن قوم أن صدوكم عن المسجد الحرام أن تعتدوا. And do not let. ولا يجرمنكم شنآن. Right? Shana'an is like a type of uh, repulsion and, and, and you know, this, this dismissal of someone you don't like and not wanting to help them. And maybe even a more of a deep-seated sort of resentment, I would say. وَلَا يَجْرَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمُ Right, so your shana'an for the Quraysh or shana'an for the polytheist. And صَدُّوكُمْ عَلَى الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ صَدُّوكُمْ, they stopped you, right? They stand in the way. عَلَى الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ أَنْ تَعْتَلُوا So do not let your hatred of them, and some of the Mufassirin, I believe, said, or your perceived hatred, the perceived hatred they have for you, either one. أَنْ صَدُّوكُمْ عَلَى الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ أَنْ تَعْتَلُوا That you should go above limits, right? أَنْ تَعْتَلُوا Or that you should be, uh, how did he translate it here? Uh, to break the law, but I would say to أَعْتِدَاء uh, means to be aggressive, right? Or, or to, to violate any uh, trust of their person. But what should you do instead? وَتَعَوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى تَعَوَنُوا Cooperate in bir and taqwa. Cooperate in that which is uh, right and good. وَلَا تَعَوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ And do not cooperate in sin and hostility. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ And have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala إِنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ in the last year of Allah's punishment is uh, severe. So, um, of course, we saw, talked about the Sabah bin Zul, and we talked about the specific reason this was revealed, but again, the general meaning that can be derived from it is this idea of equitable treatment uh, towards anybody even if they had wronged you. Now, now, what, what could have been more wronging done than what the Quraysh did and stopped the Sahaba and the Prophet ﷺ from making pilgrimage? So it's in, essentially, <clears throat> it's saying don't do a tit for tat. Don't, don't try to let at sayyah bis sayyah. It fa billati hai ahsan. Right? Don't repel a, a sayyah, uh, an evil deed with another evil deed. But repel it with ihsan. Right? Deal with it in, in a way that is ihsan. Even if here, this is talking about the polytheists. Now, obviously, this was before uh, the hukum, the ruling, where there would only be one deen in the Arabian Peninsula. This was shortly after Fatih Mecca. Uh, and so that, that ruling wasn't there yet. But nevertheless, the principle is true. And that we should not be aggressive and we should not make atidat about people who are not seeking atidat from us. Uh, they are coming to make pilgrimage. They weren't coming to do anything besides that. So just because they prevented you earlier doesn't mean that you should prevent them. Uh, and so this is the meaning of al-bir uh, wal-ihsan, or al-birri wal-taqwa. So bir means to cooperate in things that are good on a human level. So uh, the Quran talks about, uh, or some of the hadith talks about birri al-walidayn, right? Uh, and it talks about dealing with people who are not Muslim. لَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْكُمْ أَن تَضَرُّوهُمْ وَتُقْسِتُوا إِلَيْكُمْ there's no blame on you to give them bir and to treat them equitably uh, if they have not made you leave your houses and they have not been aggressive towards you so the default state even with non-muslims if they're not seeking to uh, aggrieve us and not seeking to demolish us and, and, and all those sorts of things the default state is bir the default state is to be good to them is to treat them kindly is to uh, be gentle uh, with them and uh, this is the, the Quranic uh, imperative. This is the Quranic injunction. And this also holds true. Uh, in terms of, uh, if this is true for non-Muslims, then it's even more true for our fellow brothers and sisters, our fellow believers. And so uh, they say one of the, the uh, sifat, the attributes of the awliya, is even though they may see someone making a mistake or seeing someone sinning or even someone who may be transgressing against them and, and may be uh, seeking to hurt them or trying to hurt them, that look on, on kind of the bigger picture and look at their humanity, look at them as human beings and not just um, someone who's bothering you or irritating you right now. And you grab them by the hand 
metaphorically or perhaps even literally and take them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, how many are the awliya who were patient, who were uh, forgiving, who were pardoning, who were clement with those who even uh, sought to disparage them and sought to undermine them and sought to sully their reputation? Many, many, many times this has happened, both in contemporary times and, and in our past. And it wasn't long before those people came around and either accepted Islam or accepted uh, tawbah or, or, or make tawbah or, or you know, sought to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and changed their way of life. But it takes patient, patience and forbearance and uh, expansion of and generosity of soul for those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted with this da'wah. So uh, da'wah in Allah is not about shoving Islam down people's throats and shoving rules and regulations and telling them all of the intricate details about what they can do and what they can't do. That's not the da'wah of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Right? Uh, if it gets to that. With wisdom, with kindness. And with the good and gentle admonition. And if they're disputing with you, Right? Even if it's jidal, some disputation, So dispute with them even with that which is better and best. So not ad hominem arguments, not disparage, disparaging them or even um, disparaging something of a personal nature about them, but talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the benevolence of God and tawheed and oneness of God and, and all those sorts of things. These are the things that we should uh, seek uh, in terms of the da'wah, especially those that if Allah has given you this, these meanings in your hearts, then you, then you have a responsibility. Uh, Allah ala. So the next verse after that talks about al-muharramat in terms of food, what we're not allowed to eat. So Allah SWT says, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةُ وَالْدَّمُ وَلَحْمُ الْخِنْزِيرُ وَمَا أُهِلَّ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ بِهِ وَالْمُنْخَنِقَةُ وَالْمَوْقُودَةُ وَالْمُتَرَدِّيَةُ وَالْمَطِيحَةُ وَمَا أَكَلَ السَّبْعُ إِلَّا مَا ذَكَّيْتُ وَمَا ذُبِحَ عَلَى النُصْبِ وَأَنْ تَسْتَقْسِمُ بِالْأَزْلَامِ ذَلِكُمْ فِسْقَ In translation, you are forbidden to carry on, which is uh, an animal that hasn't been slaughtered. Blood, here, blood, الدم, الدم المسفوح. So blood that has flow, uh, flowed out. So if you slaughter an animal on the blood that flows out from the carotid and the jugular vein, that is not to be eaten. Pig's meat, the, the, the meat of swine. Any animal over which any name other than God's has been invoked, and there's some difference of opinion amongst the madahib about what that means exactly, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, any animal strangled, right? Al-Munkhaniqa, min al wal uh, a one that's a victim of a violent uh, uh, blow or a fall or gored or savaged by uh, so a sabr means any animal that's a predatory animal generally it means a sabr usually means like lion or something like a lion uh, but in the verse it means any predatory animal so it could be a wolf could be a, a dog a coyote a lion uh, anything like that so anything that a predatory animal has eaten or savaged by a priest of prey, uh, unless you slaughter it. So this illa, this istisna, doesn't go uh, back to all of these asnaf. It doesn't go back to all of these things. So lahm al so the pig, even if you slaughter it properly, it's still going to be haram. So again, there's a type of so the, the, the exception doesn't refer to all of those different categories. It only, uh, uh, the categories that uh, some of them said, if you catch the animal that was hit by a blow or that fell and it hasn't died yet, uh, and it may still live on, and then you slaughter it before it actually takes its last breath, then uh, it becomes halal. And there's even some difference of opinion of that. Some of them saying, if it was going to die anyway, and then you slaughtered it, that doesn't count. So those are kind of exceptional things. Or we can look at the istisna as saying, This is what we call istisna muqata. So not referring back to those categories, but it would, with the meaning is, so don't eat any of those categories, and eat that which you have slaughtered properly. So So it means rather only the ones that you have slaughtered uh, properly. 
And then the rest of it, and this was something that was done in, in, in Jahiliyyah, anything uh, slaughtered on the, the altar of the idolaters. So sometimes they would slaughter animals for their, their idols, like in Manat, Wahubal, Wallat, Wal-Uzza. So anything like that is not going to be halal. When Tastaqsimu Bil Azlam, and Tastaqsimu Bil Azlam was a type of um, drawing marked arrows to see which one would be slaughtered. Also, this was a Jahili practice not to be done. Dhalikum uh, Fisk, right? Dhalikum, all of this is Fisk. So, uh, I guess that's much we can say about it. Dhalikum uh, Fisk, so all of the Muharramat, all of these things that we talked about. Uh, it's a type of corruption. So some of these, the prohibition goes back to the uh, type of animal or meat itself, and that would be like the, the meat of swine, like the pig, uh, or the state that it's in, which it should be the carry-on, so the dead animal that hasn't been slaughtered. So even if it's a cow or a goat, hasn't been slaughtered properly, that's also included. And also the invocation upon slaughter. So. For us, uh, dhabah, uh, there's an invocation. Some of them they have said it was required, like a zahiriya, and others of them said that uh, it's sunnah, like a shafariya, and some of them said that it's obligatory if you remember to do it, and uh, you are if you forget to do it, but don't intentionally uh, not say the bismillah when you slaughter, then it's okay to eat, and that's the madikiyya. So it could be also the type of invocation, but clearly, if the invocation is to a deity other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then وَمَا أُهِلَّ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ So that which has been sacrificed for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the mayta, then the munkhaniqa wal malkuda, so the one that has been strangled, or the one that has been struck, or the one al mutaladiyah wal matiha, the one that has fallen, or the one that, all of these are the state of the animal if it dies from its wounds in that way. وَمَا أَكَلَ السَّبْعُ Right, and that which the predatory animal has eaten. So also is not to be eaten. Uh, and then al-zabha al-nusib wal-istiqsam bil-azlam. Also this involves the type of invocation. So uh, the Quran also instructs, instructs us to eat al-halal wal-tayyib. Ya ayyuhal rusul, kunu min al-tayyibati wa'amalu salihan. Ya ayyuhal rusul, kunu min al-tayyibati. So the, the, the admonition is to the prophets or the messengers, but it's, it's universal for everybody. Kunu min al-tayyibati. وَعَمَلُوا صَالِحًا So eat from the tayyibat, from that which is tayyib, that which is good. وَعَمَلُوا صَالِحًا So there's like a connection between doing good deeds and eating from the tayyibat. And, and one of kind of the first cardinal principles of um, clearing one of, uh, of kind of deviousness and, and distracting thoughts and, um, and, and trying to get more barakah in your life, check out uh, what you're eating. In other words, Look at what, how you got your income and how you're spending it, and then the things that you're choosing to eat. You know, is it ethically uh, produced and cared for? And was the halal, uh, was the slaughtering, um, you know, done in the right way or not done in the right way? And so these are questions that, in fact, many of the ulama, some of them, Imam al Nawi, for example, he, he wouldn't eat from an animal uh, in Damascus in his time, in the 8th century or so, unless he, he saw it slaughtered in front of him. Uh, he refused to eat it. Uh, and some of the madahib, even the madikiyah, have a stipulation that if a non-Muslim is going to slaughter your animal, then you have to witness it. You have to see him do it to make sure that he's doing it right. So they believe that, you know, these conditions need to be applied uh, and then you have to see it for yourself. And I would also say in, in today's day and age, it's good to, uh, to be careful about that. Not to be overzealous, however, um, to the degree that you're you know, even questioning your neighbors if they're Muslim and your family members and kind of nitpicking, I think, to strike a good balance. It's it's good in your own personal kind of approach to life in your home to have a certain way to do things, but to be a little bit more understanding when you're, you're dealing with other people and not everyone is going to have um, necessarily a, uh, a kind of a, a level of commitment or understanding that you have. And, that's also that's also part of it. Ta'awani ala al-birr wa taqwa right? Uh, participating or cooperating in birr and taqwa. 
Then the next part of the verse, which is from the same verse, This actually uh, is reputedly the last verse uh, of the Qur'an to be revealed. Not the last chapter, but the last verse, and we'll see why. Uh, or this part of the verse. Uh, Today I have perfected your religion for you, completed my blessing upon you, and chosen as your religion, uh, or before that, today the disbelievers have lost all hope that you will give up your religion. Do not fear them, fear me. Today I've perfected your religion for you, completed my blessing upon you, and chosen as your religion, Islam. But if any of you is forced by hunger to eat such forbidden food with no intention of wrongdoing, uh, then God is most forgiving and merciful. So, al-yawma ya'isa ladina kafru What yawm is this? What day is this? The Mufassirun say that it was the day of Friday, yeah, the day of Arafah in Hajjat al in the farewell pilgrimage, which is the, the famous uh, address, the farewell sermon that the Prophet said gave to the companions. And it said on that day there were 124,000 companions assembled uh, around Arafah that the Prophet Sallallahu was addressing. And it's no coincidence, I think, if the number is true, Allah Adam, that it's the same number uh, uh, reputedly uh, of the uh, number of prophets who have been sent, uh, 124,000. So either the same number or similar number, or they're assembled on the plain of Arafat when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, gave the farewell address and when this verse was revealed. So, so خلاص, uh, 124,000 of you and, and more who didn't come to the pilgrimage. There is no, the, the, the disbelievers of Quraysh now have lost all hope that this deen was like a fad. This religion was a fad and it was just a passing thing and go away and, you know, we'll go back to the way we were. So, يَئِسُوا خلاص, uh, they are, are, are dis, dis, despairing of that idea. Right? So do not have fear of them. Have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And furthermore, On this day, I have completed your deen. Right? And I have perfected, uh, 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 I, or, or I've given you the full uh, blessing, or completed my blessing. So perfected your religion, and completed my blessing. And I have uh, been pleased with Islam, yani Islam, submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as your deen, as your way of life, as how you're going to carry on, not just here on the plain of Arafah uh, in the uh, 10th year of the Hijrah, after the Hijrah, but forever uh, until Yawm al Qiyamah. This was the, the, the Rida and the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's also said that when Abu Bakr Siddiq who heard this verse being revealed, he wept. Uh, and the reason he wept because he understood what this meant. It meant if the deen has been completed and uh, or the deen has been perfected and the, the the favor and the bounty has been completed, then that also means the mission of the Prophet is completed. And if the mission of the Prophet is completed, then there's no reason for him to remain. The only reason that the Prophet was remaining with the companions, with the Sahaba, after, let's say, the Isra al Ma'raj, you know, after seeing what he saw in the Isra al Ma'raj and the Ascension and the Laylat Usri Arihi ila Bayt al Maqdis in Mecca, the night journey, and he saw his Lord and he spoke to his Lord in a manner commensurate with his majesty, why would he come back? Why would he desire to come back? Uh, and so Ibn Bakr Siddiq understood what that meant and he knew that it wouldn't be long uh, before uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi would depart from this world and move on to Al-Rafiq Al-A'la and which is exactly what happened Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam
So, uh, and then the end, of, end part of the verse, فَمَنِ اتَّرَّ فِي مَخْمَسَةٍ غَيْرُ مُتَنَاجِفٍ لِإِثْمٍ فَإِنَّ اللَّهُ فُوْ الرَّحِيمٍ This is going back to المحرمات. So, one thing you've noticed so far, uh, just to, to, to kind of uh, close out, uh, is you have several جُمَلْ أَعْتَرَدِيَّةٍ In other words, you have some sentences in terms of the order are referring back to a sentence that came before, but then there's a sentence in between them that's talking about something completely different. That's the nature of the Quran. That's the nature of, you know, it, it, it requires you to think and it requires you to um, kind of behold the beauty and how so many ideas, right? Look at all the ideas in just three verses that we talked about and we didn't do it justice. Uh, there, there's so many ahkam in the books of fiqh that talk about these ahkam, these legal rulings, you know, they take chapters. Uh, and, you know, and honestly, we don't have the time to do that right now. It's not the context. But um, see how in just three verses it talks about al uh, uqud It's talking about contracts and that contracts you have to fulfill. And it talks about the different groups of animals that you're allowed to eat or not allowed to eat and, and why you're not eating them and whether it's because of it, uh, the type of invocation or is it due to the nature of the animal or the state that it's in. And it's also talking about this deen itself and how it's been completed and how uh, you shouldn't prevent uh, even the non-believers from going to uh, Mecca before the abrogation of this, uh, uh, and, and if they're seeking Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and to respect the Shahair, to respect the rights of Hajj and the rights, you know, the signs of God, and all of that in three verses, and then at the end, So this is going back to um, the idea of al muharramat those things, those categories that we talked about. They're not allowed to eat. Here is. A caveat or a qualification. So whoever is um, forced by hunger, right? Machmasa, like uh, means forced. Machmasa means hunger. Like you know, they means like So it's like the two sides of your stomach are your back and your stomach are touching each other. So you're like in dire straits. Uh, either it's eat from this carry on or eat from the, the flesh of the swine, or you die. That's what it means. Right? With no intention of doing wrong or wrongdoing, you're not looking to transgress against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you're looking to live. And then in that particular state, your wedge of your obligation is to eat from whatever it is that you're not usually allowed to eat from. Right? And then know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forgiving and merciful. So this is a ruhsa, this is a dispensation. If you're in a position where um, there's nothing else to eat, and your life depends upon it, uh, then the ulama say that uh, So something that's a darura, something that is a uh, oppressing need, like life and death or severe injury or something of that sort, or um, you know, severe repercussions for your health, even if it's not close to death, but something severe, then, <clears throat> then in this case, uh, it's legal, and it could even be your wedge of your obligation to eat from uh, carry on or dead animal or swine or something that has been invoked other than the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is also an example of ikmal uh, al-deen wa itmam al-ni'mah. So ikmal al-deen means this way of life. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ Other verses. Have taqwa of Allah in as much as you can. And there are dispensations if you're in a position not to do it completely. So all of this points to this is the type of Sharia, the type of system that is for all of humanity uh, and abiding for all times and all places after that. And it has built within it the leniency or the samaha, you know, the ease and the gentleness and the breadth of uh, encompassing many different people of many different backgrounds and, and understandings and so forth. And that's the beauty of the deen. So this type of you know, the ikhtilaf, even in, in, the, in the interpretation of some of these ahkam, some of these verses, it's a rahmah, it's a mercy. So it encompasses, you know, all different types of people, all different backgrounds and, and so forth. And that is itmam in ni'mah. This is a great blessing uh, that the sharia is based upon tahrim al khaba'ith wa tahlil al-tayyibat. So that which is khabith, that which is in of itself, is impure and uh, harmful will be haram. And that which is in of itself pure and uh, beneficial will be halal. Uh, it comes later in this uh, chapter. So um, that making the things that are pure are halal and things that are khabith 
are haram. And this is the na'ma and the itmam and ikmal al deen that Allah SWT promised in this, in this verse. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'la wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. So we'll stop here, inshallah, for this session. <clears throat> Barakallah feekum. Nasallahu uh, SWT ta'ala tawfiq wa sidad and to bless all of you and to continue blessing you in this uh, sacred month of Ramadan and to accept our fasting and our uh, our, our prayers and our tarawih and our uh, suhoor and waking up to eat and uh, our supplications and we ask Allah SWT and uh, Ta'ala and Ya Jalla Shah al Kareem to make us from those emancipated from the hell of the fire of hell uh, in this particular month and all of our loved ones with us inshaAllah in the Hawaii Yudarika wa Khadra Ali, Alhamdulillah Rabbi Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.